You may be seated. As you're being seated, open your Bible with me this morning to the book of 2 Peter. Book of 2 Peter. We're going to begin in chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 and following. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. <clears throat> For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the water was formed out of water and by water through which the world at the time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, <clears throat> since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of things, these things in which some are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Given all that's taken place in the world right now, especially with wars between Russia and Ukraine and the war that Israel is fighting for its very existence against Hamas, the terrorist group which is supported by Iran, a number of people have asked me, <clears throat> Pastor, do you think we're living in the last days? I mean, if all these wars and rumors of wars are going on, could Jesus be coming back any day? And of course, the short answer is yes, Jesus could come back any day. There's a great deal of fear in the hearts of people this morning, uncertainty about the future of the economy, the future of our country, the future of the world at large. But as followers of Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you this morning that we are not to be gripped by fear. We have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound judgment. And as we open the Word of God, He speaks to us to keep us from being fearful. He tells us that these things are going to happen, but He also tells us how that we should approach them. So with this in mind, as I prayed about what to preach this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit directed my attention to this chapter, which offers not only the assurance that Jesus is going to come again, but explains why he is waiting so long and gives us some very practical instruction as to how we are to comport ourselves in the meantime. So these are the three things we'll consider, the certainty of our Lord's return, the reason for his delay, and our responsibility in light of this knowledge. But before we jump into the heart of the text... Note with me that Peter begins this chapter with a prefatory word. Scholars believe Peter was writing this as he was in prison in Rome and he was awaiting his certain execution. You want to talk about his understanding of the end times. His end was coming imminently. And he's writing to Christians who are living in fearful times, times when there is persecution, times when everything seems unsafe, and he is encouraging them just 
for this specific reason, and it's an encouragement to us as well. He begins by stating the purpose of his letter, which is to stir up your sincere mind by way of remembrance. He goes on to tell them that they should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets, the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by the apostles. And what he wants them to remember, what he wants us to remember this morning, is what Jesus said about the second coming and what the apostles as they wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, put into the Gospels that Jesus said about the second coming. You see, while in Acts chapter 1, Jesus assures us that no one knows when the Son of Man is going to return, only the Father, he also promises us that he will return. And he wants us to look for the signs of his return. If we were to go over to Matthew 24 and we were to read what is known as the Olivet Discourse, Jesus goes through a number of things. He tells us a number of things that are going to take place before he comes again. Among those things are wars and rumors of wars. Wow, I don't think you can turn on any news station or look at any Internet news channel and not find wars and rumors of wars. I hear people talking about it. Do you think China's going to get involved in the Middle East? Is, is this going to be World War III? Those are rumors of wars. There are wars going on. There are rumors of wars. Natural disaster, famine, earthquakes taking place around the world right now. A rise of anti-Christian sentiment and persecution of Christians. If you don't believe that's real, you have been living in a cave. I mean, look at what happens when we get a Christian... Speaker of the house. He's a weirdo. He's a cultist. He's a nut because he believes in Jesus. Clearly, we are living not only in a world that is anti Christian, but we are living in a country that is increasingly becoming infected and influenced by the spirit of Antichrist, a falling away. Whereas Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, people will not endure sound doctrine, but will instead gather to themselves preachers who tell them what they want to hear rather than what God knows they need to hear. That is taking place even in our own denomination right now. False prophets. You don't have to look far to find these, especially those preaching that sin is okay with God because he gets us. Or that he just wants us to be wealthy and healthy and wise. False prophets have always been with us, but there seems to be a proliferation of them today and then Jesus says in Matthew 24 that before he returns the love of many will grow cold people who were once in love with Jesus who were once practicing their faith sharing their faith involved in spreading the gospel working with other Christians in a local congregation they fall away they quit going to church the priorities change and the things of the world become more important than to them than the things of God and while all these things have occurred throughout history, never before have we had the worldwide information and communication we have today, and never before have we been able to say without any equivocation that these things are taking place globally and that they seem to be on the rise. So why does he want us to remember these things? Well, because if we're not careful, we can easily forget what our Lord told us, and forgetting his words can lead us to panic, to apostasy, to weakened faith, to a cold love, to an uncontrollable fear, and to a number of other things that we don't want. But remember Jesus in Matthew 24 says, See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place, but that is not the end yet. That's why Peter talks about stirring up our sincere and pure minds. He wants us with a mind that is unclouded by the corrupt influence of the world and unclouded by fear to remember that Jesus and the apostles have said something to us about the second coming. I want to focus for a moment on this word translated to remember. It's the Greek word from which we get our word mnemonic. It can mean to stimulate the mind or to refresh the memory. It's a noun that speaks, and this is very important, it's a noun that speaks not only to the effect that uh, not only to the reality of remembering but what effect that memory has on the person so I want you to remember but I want that memory to stir you to action that's what this word means 
truth is, we all tend to forget. Oh, come on, you forget. You forget where your car keys are. You forget where you parked. You get around your kids too long, you'll forget their names. You'll call them the wrong... Don't tell me you haven't called your kid the wrong name. We just forget. I was reading an article this week online by a psychological rehabilitation specialist named Kendra Cherry. She's writing at verywellmind.com. In an article entitled, Four Reasons Why People Forget, and... Cherry notes that people forget surprisingly fast. Research has determined that 65, that 56% of information is forgotten within the hour, 66% is forgotten after a day, and 75% of what we see or learn or hear is forgotten within six days. She says there's four reasons we forget. We forget caused by delay or by decay, according to the decay theory. Memories not retrieved and rehearsed tend to fade and eventually disappear. We forget because of interference. This is where brain overload comes into play. There's a proactive side to this where old memories make it difficult to remember new information and a retroactive side where new information fills our memory banks and makes it difficult to recall things previously remembered. There's forgetting caused by failure to store. This occurs when we scan information to which we should be paying attention. And if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> did you hear what I said? Oh, yeah, honey, I heard every word. <laughs> what did I say? Hmm. Well, I picked up the gist of it. <laughs> and she says, that's our problem. We just pick up the gist of things, and the devil's always in the details, Right? And so we can't recall the details because those details were never stored to begin with. We were just skimming along. And finally, we forget because we intentionally forget. This is where the mind intentionally forgets things as a self-preservation mechanism, particularly when those memories are painful. But, of course, the best way to remember, says Cherry, is to write things down and rehearse it. The worst pencil is better than the best memory. And that's the point Peter's making. And if it was true for first century Christians who had no newspapers, no television, no internet, no cell phone, no spam emails to distract them, how much more true is it for you and me? How much more do we need to be reminded of these truths about our Lord's return? It is with that in mind that I'm coming to you this morning from 2 Peter chapter 3. Now to the body of our text. There's three things I want you to see. The first is the certainty of our Lord's return. In verse 3, when he says, first of all, a better translation ought to be above all else. He's, he's, he's telling us that he's about to say something of extreme importance, and he wants us to pay attention. Listen up. This is one of the most important things you're going to hear, he says. He says that in the last days, scoffers will come. Now, scoffers can be translated as mockers or deceivers. And the idea here is that the intention of these naysayers is certainly not to engage in honest conversation about the second coming of Jesus Christ. To the contrary, their entire purpose is to deceive and derail the faith of those who follow Christ. This is evidenced by both their morals and the question that they posit. Morally, verse 3 says that deceivers are people who live not according to the Word of God, but according to their own desires. The word lusts is a strong desire. So they, these people live according to what they want, not according to what God says. They mock us for our faith. They have no desire to hear or learn the truth. They simply want to plant seeds of doubt within the hearts of believers to cause them to question whether or not what Jesus said is really true. Sounds like Satan, doesn't it? Their question reveals something of an atheistic, naturalistic worldview. In essence, they, they're saying, ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning. They're saying that nothing has changed from the beginning of time. They are arguing against God's intervention in the world, and modern scoffers are those who deny not only God's existence, but the, thus, consequently, his involvement in human affairs. They're saying there is no God, and if there was, he would be involved in human affairs, but we don't believe he is. 
But Peter, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is not without a response to their argument. The Greek here is extraordinarily insightful. One translation says, for this they willingly are ignorant of. It's saying that these scoffers willfully and intentionally ignore truths that demonstrate their claim to be false. That they are, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, people who did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now, Paul lit, or Peter lists three things these scoffers overlook and by do, doing so demonstrate that they are not only the blind who cannot see, they are the blind who will not see. These are truths that are right before the eyes of any rational, logical, thinking person. The first... In verse 5 is the creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Has it ever occurred to you why there's such a huge debate about creationism? I mean, what's the big deal? Why do school districts across the country ban it from being taught? Have you ever noticed that this is one of the hardest things that the world tries to deny is creationism? I mean, it's like they are rabid about it. And do you, do you wonder why? Well, I'll tell you why. Naturalistic evolution claims there is no God. They insist that he is a figment of our imagination, a crutch for the weak-minded, and from their perspective, just nothing. They do not believe in God. Denying him, they seek to explain everything by saying it just naturally exists. But what Peter is saying is that without God, there would be no heaven or no earth. Now, while evolution has tried to come up with a godless theory for the existence of all that is and has perpetuated that lie to the point that if you don't accept it, you are not accepted in the academic realm, you are looked upon as being ignorant or backward, it doesn't change the fact that the facts are not on their side. Evolution cannot explain where the first matter came from. Well, some say, well, there's a big bang. Well, there was a, where did the first matter come from? They don't know. And they have some really crazy theories. And if you do any time researching this, you'll find out that some people believe the earth got started by aliens. Well, then you just have to ask the question, where did the aliens come from? They don't know. They just don't know. Naturalistic evolution is quite clueless. It cannot explain how things in the universe are ordered other than saying it happened by chance. Naturalistic evolution cannot, cannot explain why the missing links cannot be found. It cannot explain why their theory cannot be rec replicated in accordance with their own scientific method. You see, rather than facing the facts and considering all the possibilities, evolutionists are not really open to the truth, but rather begin with a preconceived notion that there is no God, no creator, and that there must be some other explanation for all that is. They violate their own principles concerning facts and possibilities, and thus they are willfully ignorant of the truth. In short, people who would know better if they would open their eyes and accept truth for what it is are blinded from that truth, and their blindness is in accordance with their own desires. They are, as the Scripture says, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Because they're not looking for the truth, they won't find the truth. As someone said, there is none so blind as he who will not see. But not only do they denounce the creation, they denounce the flood. Just like all the evidence points to a creator, all the evidence also points to a flood. It's very interesting if you do some research on the flood, scientists now believe in a regional flood. They can't deny that there was a flood of some kind, but it was just an isolated flood around the Black Sea. When I was going to junior college in Dallas, Texas, uh, I, I, I was looking for any course that would get me a credit. Somebody say amen. amen. And so I took a course in historical geology, and we learned all about rocks. And our professor took us out in Dallas. Dallas is 853 miles from the closest shore. And we started digging for fossils and rocks, and guess what we found? Shark's teeth. 
What are sharks doing? I mean, I know there's loan sharks, there, but I, I wasn't expecting real shark's teeth. How did that happen? Must have been a flood. I have a friend who was a member of my church in Denver, and he's a photographer, and he went throughout the Rocky Mountains taking pictures of rock formations, and he published a book. I have it in my library. It's called Do You See What I See? And he has all these pictures of rocks that are in the exact shape and size and look exactly like reptiles. Well, one of them is an alligator. How did that alligator get on top of a mountain and turn into rock? Folks, you have to be blind to not realize that there was a flood at one time that covered all the face of the earth. But these scoffers deny that. They don't want to see the truth because, you see, if they see the truth, then they have to admit that there is a God and they don't want to be anybody but their own God. To accept creationism and the flood at face value is to accept that man is not his own God. And, well, the scoffers in our culture can't do that. They are willfully ignorant. And if you want more proof for the flood or for creation, go to Answers in Genesis website. It's loaded with good information. But Peter gives a third response to their question, and this is the promise of God. You see, the evolutionists have no idea why the sun continues to burn, why the planets revolve around the earth, why the earth revolves on its axis, and why gravity works to hold the earth in place. They understand that it happens and how it happens. They can explain to you what gravity does and the effects of gravity. What they cannot realize is how it came to be. And why it is so, given all the complexities of creation, these people, foolish as they are, even deny intelligent design. They say that everything in the world is one big accident. Well, I've had some accidents and they never turn out well. It's amazing. If you don't accept that God created the world, if you don't accept that he's intervened in the world through creation and the flood, then you'll be equally as blind to the truth that the world is being sustained by his word reserved for a date in the future of judgment. You see, those blinded to the truth of creation, the flood and the sustaining power of God are also blinded to this reality that there is a judgment day. They cannot realize that the earth will be destroyed again, but this time by fire. They refuse to see the rainbow for what it is, God's promise to never destroy the earth with water. Instead, they use it as a symbol of rebellion against God. They cannot see that one day each of us will stand before God and give account for our lives. They are blinded, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, they are blinded from the life of God by the darkness that is in them. And Jesus says men are lovers of darkness rather than lovers of light. John chapter 3. This is Peter's answers to the scoffers. They have blinded themselves from the truth that could save them, blinded by their own desires. But not only does he answer the question of the scoffers, he writes to reassure his readers, that's you and me, that irrespective of what others may say or think, God is not a liar. If he said, if Jesus said he's coming again, he's coming again. But his purpose and his timetable are different than ours, which brings up our second observation, the reason for his delay. Notice several things. God's timetable, folks, is not like yours and mine. Don't make the mistake here that some well-intentioned Christians make when they come to this text. Some of them, and I've had them, and they, listen, they're good people, they're just wrong. They try to tell me that the earth, God created the earth by evolution, but he created man specially. Well, the, the problem is you can't split that down the middle. The Bible says in the, in, in the first few chapters of Genesis that God created the world in six days. Well, here's what they say. They say, well, God could have created the world in a billion years because it says that a day to the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. No, that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says the day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. It's an analogy used here to make a point, and the point is that God doesn't reckon time as we reckon time. 
Another problem with that argument is that contextually this verse is not talking about creation. Creation was mentioned in verse 5 as a response to the scoffers who claim that God does not intervene in time and space. But Peter has moved on from that point. In fact, in the Greek, verse 8 begins a new paragraph or a shift in thought. He's now back to his main theme of the second coming. He's explaining to Christians who might be tempted to believe the scoffers something about the patience and the long-suffering and the mercy of God. As much as it pains me to say this, there are no watches in heaven. It's a humbling thing to have to write. God doesn't wear a watch. Because he's not constrained to time like you and I are. He's above time, in control of it. He has given us specific things whereby we can measure time. He's given us things like the morning, the evening, the seasons, the waning and the waxing of the moon to help us observe time. When he speaks of time in the Bible, specifically like the morning and evening in creation, he is speaking to us in terms we can comprehend, helping us to understand the time frame within which he has done something or will do something. And by the way, when the Bible says that the morning and evening were the first day, he's talking about a 24-hour period because there is no other time time period that has a morning and an evening only a day just because you and I can't fully understand how he did that doesn't mean he did do that doesn't mean he didn't do it you see he did it even if we don't understand how he did it but here Peter is saying And I paraphrase, don't get distracted by these deceivers who claim Jesus isn't coming again. While they say that things have been the same since the beginning, they're willfully overlooking the truth that God has intervened in creation and the flood and is presently reserving the world for judgment. And don't let this thing be hidden from you. And the Greek word here is the same one used earlier when he says that these truths are hidden from the scoffers. Don't be like the scoffers. Don't intentionally be led down and deceived by the wrong path. He says, God's timetable is different than ours because God is above time and the ruler of time and space. Just because he doesn't come when you think he should doesn't mean he won't come. What seems like forever to us is nothing to God. God will send Jesus back at the perfect time, his time. Secondly, the reason for his delay, the Lord is patient. He's not slow in keeping his promise, as some might claim, but rather he is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing, that's the will of God, Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, when you hear people say that not everybody can be saved, listen, I don't know who's elect and who's not. I just don't, and neither do you. All we know is that God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. God sent Jesus. The Bible says that God loved the world in this way, that he sent his only begotten son, the world that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In 1 John chapter 2, it says that Jesus Christ is a propitiation or a payment for for our sins, but not only for ours, but for the whole world. So I believe, listen to me, I believe that anybody can be saved if they will give their heart and their life to Jesus Christ. If you repent of your sins, Jesus will forgive you and he will save you. Now, God is not dilatory, remiss, or tardy when it comes to his promise of the return of Christ. To the contrary, God will intentionally wait to the last moment so that people will have more time to repent. That's the mercy of God. Remember, grace is unmerited favor that he gives us. Mercy is withholding judgment that we deserve. So God in his mercy is withholding judgment that people deserve. When we look at the evil that's being perpetrated in our world, the rise of crime, you can't watch the news and see what Hamas did to these innocent civilians, to children, to families, and you can't not watch that and, 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 not, and, and not have this sense within you crying out for justice. But listen to me. 
We may not see the justice of God in our lifetime, but God's justice will not be thwarted. God will hold everyone accountable. Someday the Prince of Peace will come and Jesus will judge and God will judge and every wrong will be addressed. It's an absolute fact. He's saying against this backdrop of what had been said about the final judgment that at that point it's going to be too late for these people to repent. You know, there does come a time when people can't repent anymore. The Bible says in Genesis, he says, my spirit will not always tarry with man. Some people don't realize that, but some, at some point... At some point, they're not going to have another opportunity to repent. This brings us to a couple of words. The word patient means to endure or to, to be forbearing. So that's what he is he's saying. God is, is patient. He's forbearing, much more so than us. And the second word here is the word willing. It speaks to an intention, desire, or specific purpose. It is telling us that God's intention, his desire, his purpose in delaying his coming is so that people can come to him and be saved. And we're sitting around thinking, oh, I wish Jesus would come because I'm so tired of this world. I feel the same way. But I, I want you to see, I want you to understand that God isn't looking at things from our perspective. I, I hope this doesn't offend you. Maybe it will. God is less concerned about your comfort than he is about the lost people that need to be saved. But he is patiently, intentionally, purposely waiting but he will keep his promise. And that's the third thing I want you to see. In fact, this verse begins, this verse begins in verse 10 with the Greek words, will come. It says in, in our translation, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In the, in the Greek, it starts with this promise, will come the day of the Lord. And, and it's put there intentionally to emphasize God's promise that he will come again. He will come again. Know with me that before telling us that the heavens and earth will be destroyed by far fire, he tells us that suddenly, unexpectedly, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. Writing to the church at Thessalonica, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will be just like a thief in the Nile. While they are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Jesus says in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, verse 42 and following, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day our Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you be ready to, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. There's a heretical group called preterists who believe all the prophecies concerning the second coming were fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., but don't believe such nonsense. Scripture assures us in Revelation 1-7 that when Jesus returns in the cloud, every eye will see him. It will be a universal event. No one, no one living will have any question about what has happened. Having been reminded of these things specifically for the purpose of motivating us to action, what should our response be? I mean, now that he has stirred up our memory and, and he's doing that so that we will properly respond, what is our response? Well, verse 11 sets a stage by asking us a pointed question. Knowing God's judgment is coming, that the things of this earth are temporal at best and will be destroyed, what kind of people should we be? He said, I want to say something to you this morning, folks. We should not be like the world. We should not be like everyone else around us. If you think being a Christian simply means having an insurance policy from hell, you haven't quite clued into what reality is. 
Being a Christian means that you are following Jesus Christ in this world and that the world is going to treat you just like it treated Jesus. You see, we have a, a group of Christians today who want one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. They want to be accepted by God and accepted by the world. But the scripture says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. So we, and in fact, it says, come out from among them and be separate. That doesn't mean you need to be a weirdo. I know a lot of people who are just weird. They're not weird for Jesus. They're just weird. You've met some. But what he is saying is that our lives should be marked by a difference, the difference of the Holy Spirit, the difference that transformation has taken place in our life, a difference that demonstrates that we have the Spirit of God not only in control of our lives, but walking with us, directing us, showing us, teaching us. Notice the ways that we are supposed to respond. Number one, verse 11, holy conduct and godliness. Our lives should be a contrast to those of the lost world around us. This ought to be pervasive in every part of our life. The way we treat our family, the way we treat our neighbors, the way we treat the waiter or the waitress at the restaurant. It, our life should be just oozing holiness and godliness. There ought to be a difference to us. Our lives are set apart, marked by our conduct. Secondly, we are to live, live with a sense of anticipation. Do we live with a sense of anticipation? I mean, do you ever wake up in the morning and think, okay, this might be the last day I have because Jesus could come back today. I wonder how I'm going to spend this day knowing that Jesus could come back today. Has that thought ever occurred to you? And if not, why not? That's what it means to live with anticipation. You anticipate things. You're waiting for your package from Amazon to arrive, and you're checking your front door every 15 minutes. You live with anticipation. Your, your kids or your grandkids are coming to visit you, and you keep wondering, where are they? I wonder if they're on the road. I wonder if their plane's on time. We live with things that have anticipation built into them, but are you living with the anticipation that Jesus Christ is coming again, and it could be today before the cowboys get beat by <laughs> Diligent to keep our lives pure from sin, verse 14. That's part of being prepared, being diligent to keep ourselves from becoming entangled with the things of the world, living by a different standard than the world. The word translated diligent means to be eager, prompt, and zealous, knowing that we're going to stand before him at any moment. What should we work hard at doing? We should be diligent. I was, I was, I was on what used to be Twitter, now it's X. I wish they'd just figure out the names for these things and keep them, right? I was watching it last night, and there's this guy, and he's got an AR-15, and this other guy shows him how to take it down. They're both military guys. they got uniforms on, and he shows him how to move it. And then they show another scene, and so he throws the guy to the ground, takes his gun. And they show another scene, and it's these two kind of guys in the hood, right? And they're just kind of in their jeans, and one of them's got a gun. <laughs> and he tries to grab it, and the next scene is he's standing before the pearly gates. <laughs> and I just thought that, well, that was kind of <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> he, he, wasn't, he wasn't being very diligent. <laughs> Number four, using our time to bring people to faith in Christ. We need to remember God has an appointed time. When the trumpet sounds, there's no more time for people to come to faith. That's why we have to be diligent to share our faith. That's why we preach the Word of God. That's why we support missionaries around the world, because Time is limited. If you don't think time is limited, you're just not old enough yet. Because as you get older, listen, I tell people this, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it spins, man. It's true. Life just goes faster and faster. We need to, as the scripture says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Number five, be on your guard against those who would twist the scripture. Verse 16. While there are many things concerning the second coming that are difficult to understand, we cannot be distracted from the central truth that Jesus is coming again. When I was in seminary, I had a professor of systematic theology, Dr. Boyd Hunt, sweet, 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 godly man. He said, I believe in a two-advent eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of the end times. He said, I believe Jesus came once 
and I believe he's coming again. And all the other things are ancillary to that. Jesus came once, Jesus is coming again. Well, do you believe in a pre-trib, you know, post-trib? What you? We'll talk about that when we get to Revelation in January. But for now, we just need to know that he came once and he is coming again. And we need to be on guard against those people who would twist the scripture and try to tell us that he's not coming. Number six, beware of the influence of the world around you. Verse 17, how easy it is for us to allow the world to impact us. Satan is clever, much more so than people believe. He's the prince of the power of the air, and he works to compromise Christians to, to get them to accept sin as the new norm. We cannot become desensitized to sin. When I was five years old, I was sitting in my grandfather's 1958 Buick Roadmaster. That's a land yacht, folks. And I was sitting on my grandfather's knee. My dad had gone in to talk to somebody in an establishment. And on the radio, Walter Cronkite came on and said, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States has been shot. It was Kennedy. I'll never forget that. Five years old. And I, I remember as a five-year-old, I remember the mourning the country went into. And I remember the shock. And now we've become so desensitized to violence. Doesn't, things don't shock us anymore. Folks, we need to be aware and on guard against being desensitized to sin. Listen up. The closer we are to God, the more filled we are with the Holy Spirit, the more sensitive we will be to how horrible sin is, and we will not view it lightly finally what does he say he says grow in the lord specifically we're told to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our lord to, what does it mean to grow in the grace of the lord it means not only to, to live with this conscious awareness of his unmerited favor towards us that we were not worthy of salvation but that he he blessed us with unmerited favor so that we could be saved but that to whom much is given much is required so if we have been recipients of the marvelous grace of God, we need to extend that grace to others, folks. Anybody get on your nerves? You ever have those people in your life? We call them EGR, extra grace required. And their personalities are like fingernails on a chalkboard. You, you know, every one of you right now is thinking about somebody that, that you know is like that, right? But you see, our sin is odious to God, and yet he loves us anyways, and he's gracious towards us. And what he's telling us is that we need to be gracious like that to other people. We need to forgive other people when they've offended us. Forgiving one another, it says in Ephesians, as Christ, as God has forgiven you in Jesus Christ. We need to love our enemies we need to grow in the grace of the Lord, but not only in the grace, in the knowledge of our Lord. How do we grow in the grace of God? We grow in the grace of God when we understand who God is, how he loved us, how he saved us. And as we understand who he is from Scripture, then we're able to live that out in relation to other people. Jesus is coming again. I remember the little song when I was growing up. Jesus may, Jesus may come in the morning. Jesus may come at noon. Jesus may come in the evening. So keep your heart in tune. What a good word for you and me this morning.